All right, you may be seated. You know, last week uh, we get, began our study in the book of Luke, and so I just want to do a quick recap because we didn't finish chapter 1, uh, but we're going to pick up uh, tonight probably somewhere around verse 38 and, and wrap this chapter up. You know, in our introduction last week, we talked about Luke and who he was and his accounts uh, for writing the book, and we saw that he had wrote this book as well as the book of Acts to the Honorable the Theophilus, and uh, nothing as much is known about him except uh, people believe he may have been a Gentile uh, of some notoriety or in some special position. Uh, we also learned that Luke was not uh, a Jew, you know, and, and uh, it's believed that he was a Gentile, and it's also that he was not a follower of Christ. He was not a disciple. So Luke went around and collected all this data because we saw last week that he investigated he went around collecting data from people who were eyewitnesses to certain things. And then he started talking last week uh, about the birth of John the Baptist. He foretold that to John the Baptist's father, uh, Zechariah, while he was serving duty in the temple as a priest. If y'all remember, Zechariah's faith didn't seem to come in line with that. And as a result, he left there unable to talk. Y'all remember that? And then uh, after uh, that, you know, uh, the birth of Jesus was foretold, you know, and uh, Mary had a visitation, and the angel came to her and told her that she was highly favored among women and, uh, and that God had blessed us and she was going to bear a son. And uh, Mary's response was a lot different from Zachariah's that, you know, she believed what she had been told, and uh, the angel even confirmed that when we get down to probably by verse 35 of chapter 1, where he told her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. And then he said, what's more, your relative Elizabeth, now that's important because that's going to explain why Mary do what she does tonight when we see this. Your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. Again, we remember that Elizabeth had been barren, very old, kind of like an Abraham-Sarah situation. Her and, uh, and Zechariah was old, but now... Uh, she gets pregnant. And then it says, people used to say she was barren, but she now is in her sixth month. And then from that, we get this famous saying that a lot of people quote, for nothing is impossible with God. In other words, the, the point being made there is the fact that God again had moved on the life of someone who was well past childbearing age, kind of like he did with Sarah and Abraham. And so she used that to say that. And Mary's response to all that was, I am the Lord's servant. We saw that was a whole big contrast between her and Zechariah. And then he says, may everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. Now, so from that, tonight we pick up in verse 39, for those of you who are with us in chapter 1. Because after Mary hears that and found out that her relative Elizabeth is pregnant, okay, now Mary decides to go and visit her relative, you know, probably to encourage her on because, again, there was a joyous time, the fact that she was pregnant at that age. And so now this journey that Mary goes on is not something that take, took a day. It took several days to get there. And, uh, and, and, and if Mary was traveling by herself, this was not an easy journey. And so, but she was determined to go there to show her support to her relative. And so, like I say, we make say, Elizabeth was some kind of distant cousin of hers. You know, that, there's no uh, uh, evidence to say either way. Some people say she could have been an aunt, some say a cousin, but we know that they were related in some way. Now, it says in verse 39, where we pick up the night to 41, we hear this powerful greeting that when she get there, say, a few days later, Mary hurried to the hill country to Judea, to the town where Zechariah lived. She entered the house and greeted Elizabeth, at the sound of Mary's greeting, Elizabeth's child, who would have been, what's his name? John, leaped in her womb. It leaped in her, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Now get this. Mary said something, and John responded. You know, Fred, I tried to figure out how, how could that be? Well, we know that the Holy Spirit had come upon Mary, and 
it is possible that in speaking to her and the fact that Elizabeth was in power, had, had the spirit come on her for John to, you know, to be get impregnated with John, then maybe that was some spiritual connection. I, I don't know. It just, it just struck me as odd that by her speaking, John responded. And John was in the womb. And what we're going to see here, it looked like John get this spiritual connection with God even before he was born. Brother Mike, go ahead. Yes, uh, the angel of the Lord had promised uh, Zachariah that the child would be already filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay. So the, 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 the greetings both was, was touched by, by the, the baby in the womb, both of them, because they were already filled with the Holy Spirit from the womb. The Bible gives us a clear example of that. Okay. So since, so that was different. That was a different, uh, different way of greeting because the Bible tells us if, you, if the baby was already filled in the womb, then the Holy Spirit was already in the child from the womb. So then that's where the greeting came from. The, there was a connection between Jesus and John. Okay. And, and that's what, that's what. Uh, Amen. Okay. It said, it said, uh, for, starting 14, it said, you will have great joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the eyes of the Lord. He must never touch wine or other alcoholic drinks. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before his birth. So, so again, going back, and so what, I'm, what that says then is that even by Mary making this greeting to him, there was some connection there, whether that was the feeling or he was already filled, or did Mary have anything to do with it? Because I'm sure she got the spirit of her. Now, because the, we read earlier that the spirit had overcome her and empowered her yes, when she conceived. So whatever it was, I'm agree with Mike, the spiritual connection took place, and John just heard her voice. John just an embryo, whatever it is. You know, he ain't that, he ain't, he just, he just a, you know, that almost begged the question, when life began. I, I'm not here to debate that, you know, how people see that, because I know that's a hot button topic, but that does beg the question. In people's mind, when does life begin? I'm not going to touch it, Major, but Mike looks like he just want to jump in that. I, I, I'm going to leave it. I just, I'm just asking the question because, because I know you're going to hear a lot about that in the coming months. That debate is out there. Mike, go ahead. Pastor, we can't leave it alone. Uh, the thing is, we cannot mention something and people listening, and we have to give the facts where the Bible is true. The Bible says, when he said, Jeremiah, I knew you before you were formed. Before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew you. So if God knew the child before the child was already formed, then this is where we have to stand where he, we don't have to agree with um, people's politics and what is going on and everything else. But the truth of the word of God, we have to stand there. Okay. And you don't have to agree or, on one side or another, but where the word of God stands, I knew you from your mother's womb. Before you were formed, I knew you. So, so what do you have to say on that? <laughs> and, and, and I know in the Catholic Church, they stand on that. They build a, a lot of their teaching around that scripture in Jeremiah, you know, and say, okay, so, so in, in that mindset is that the minute you conceive, the minute the sperm hit the egg or whatever, and conception take place, you know, life is there in, from that standpoint. And because there's the belief that life is there, that's why the big issue about aborting. So now if you abort the minute you conceive, are you taking a life? Just think about it. I'm, I'm not going to debate that because I know that's hot, but I, I want to say something. I want to say something. Wayne, too. okay, I didn't see you, man. You got to yeah, let me know. Uh, to piggyback, I'm going to agree with um, what Brother Mike said. Years ago, years ago, um, um, I remember I was getting a procedure done, you know, so my wife didn't want to mess around at the time because she said, you know, there's a possibility that she might get pregnant. But anyway, I went ahead and never knew that she had got pregnant. And she, without I knowing, went to get the um, abortion done. 
set up the appointment, everything. I did not have a clue about none of this. And she said, before she went into the building, what made her turn around and just cry is that she actually heard the baby inside her womb say, no mama. She felt that in her spirit that the baby said, no mama, why you wanna do that? And she said that thing broke her down right there in that parking lot. And while the people was getting the room ready, she said she just couldn't do it. She got back in the car and she just drove back. And it, were, it took her a while for her to tell me about the situation. So I agree with, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a funny topic, but you gotta, you gotta stand on the truth. Amen. And there is life, so. Amen. You know, and, 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 uh, and, and, and I know based on that Jeremiah scripture, that's where a lot of uh, people plant their flag and say that's why people believe in his heart uh, core and think that any time a person aborts a baby, if you don't have a good reason, even some people, I think even in the Catholic faith at one time, the baby's life was just as important as the mama's life. That means if it came down to it, you're going to try to save that baby's life before the mama. I don't know all their doctrine, but I know that's a big issue for them and, and a lot of people who are pro-life and see that passage as being a foundational truth about when life begins. Now, we can all have different views on that and all that because that is an issue that people are faced with. And there are going to be some people and there are probably people in church who have aborted babies or had an abortion for the, at some point in time. And so all I can say is that if you have done that, God is a forgiving God, you know, if, if you did that. Now, if, again, you know, uh, Somebody may say, well, what's, what's your view, Pastor Bolden? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm almost, I, I agree with what Mike said, but I kind of look at things, and this is me nuancing this. Now, I don't, I'm pro-life. I don't believe in abortion. I got my daughter, when she got pregnant, you know, that issue came on the table, and that was a no-starter. You're going to have this baby if me and your mama got to take care of it. I know it's inconvenience. I know it's not a good time but you're going to have the baby, and then we'll decide what we're going to do later. But the issue that always come up is the disagreement within the medical field is when does life start? The life start the minute the egg is fertilized by the sperm, or does life start when there's a heartbeat or some point in time after that? And that's where the big debate lies, trying to, you know, for some people, as soon as the egg is hit with the sperm, bam. But for some, is that okay? It's not life until it's a heartbeat. And that's probably a valid argument because I know I've been around a lot of people who have been considered brain dead. But they are not officially declared dead until their heart stops. You know, I, I remember standing with my dad, you know, he had been on this machine and and, and, and all that time, they still considered him alive because his heart was beating. But it was only when his heart stopped beating that the doctor said, now we can declare him. So this issue is big, and, and, and the church is divided on this issue. But what I hope that we can see is that this issue shouldn't cause us to have hatred towards someone else or animus towards someone who may have made that decision out of ignorance, out of their own will, you know, you know, you may be hardcore, hey, you know that having sex unprotected, you could get pregnant. So why are you going to make the baby pay for your mistake? If you know you're going to have sex, protect yourself unless you want children. But again, there's a strong argument from some people, hey, people got a right to choose how they want to sin. But Pastor, Go ahead, Fred. If, if, if life comes from God, then God is the one that controls that thing. Not necessarily us. I know we, we, we come together and, and life happens. But if life comes from God, then God gives life, you know, on his own when he wants to. You know, so, so it comes, I think, before, you know, because some people, you know, they talk about predestination. So, so God has all. No, no, don't go there, Fred. Don't please. Don't go there. I, didn't, I, I didn't even want to go here tonight. I don't know. I just stopped there. But anyway, go ahead. Go ahead. If life comes from God, then we, we don't know 
the, the moment that God gives life. Okay. And, 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 that's, a, and that's a valid uh, uh, position to take, too. But because of that, and because of the church and some church position, and the medical field position, and people who feel like they got a right to choose to do whatever they want to do with their own body, this is a tough issue for Christians today. And, 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 and that's why I try to say to people, you have to have a, a conviction in your own heart what God has you on, on this particular issue based on scripture and based upon your understanding of the scripture. Because, you know, um, medical uh, teachings and understandings don't always agree with what God say. And so what we see here is that, let me get back to this, it says that it says, at the sound of Mary's greeting, Elizabeth's child leaped within her womb, John, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. So we see the Holy Spirit was very active. Luke give good records of the Holy Spirit being active, you know, before Jesus was born, but it shows us that the Holy Spirit was active even before the book of Acts. Because some people think that the Holy Spirit didn't get very active in people's lives until after their Pentecost. But we see here that the Holy Spirit was active even before Pentecost. Now the thing that happened on Pentecost was the evidence of speaking another tongue. Because here it don't say nobody spoke in nothing different when they got the Holy Spirit came on. Mike, go ahead. Get a mic. Get a mic. Yes, Pastor. Uh, it's more than that. They're speaking in tongues. As, uh, before Pentecost, after Pentecost, the Holy Spirit lived, dwelt in the believer. The Holy Spirit shall dwell in the believer forever. That's, uh, that's after Pentecost. It, it come and lived in them. That's what Jesus said when they tell Jesus, why are you leaving? And we need you to stay. He said, no, if I go, it will be, be better for you. Because if I go, the Holy Spirit will come and will empower you and will live within you. Amen. And it will empower you. So which means the power that we have through the gospel is because the Holy Spirit is within us and the Holy Spirit empowers us and guides us and strengthens us. So not just speaking in tongues. You can have the, they had that evidence, but you, not just speaking in tongues, but the power of the Holy Spirit dwells in the believer. Amen. And, 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 and that's the, the, the point I was trying to make is that the, the other side of that coin seemed to think that everything centers around Acts 2. Pentecost. And so therefore, there has to be this feeling in Pentecostal style in order to say you have been filled with the Holy Spirit. But obviously, the Holy Spirit, like you said, Mike, the Holy Spirit can come in people. And here, if that was a requirement, then there should have been some evidence here. Okay. And, and, but, but again, that's, you know, that's a whole diff different topic, but I just wanted to throw that in here right now because a lot of times people say, well, the Holy Spirit was not active until after Acts 2. Well, like Brother Mike said, after Acts 2, Jesus has said, while I'm here, can be here, but then he's going to come and he's going to dwell in you. So anybody who has been saved and say that they believe in Jesus Christ and been baptized, you can't separate the Spirit from your relationship with Jesus. Because in Romans, it talks about if you don't have the spirit, then you're not here. So that means all believers should have the Holy Spirit in them when they accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Forget about the other evidence, but just say the Holy Spirit ought to be in you. Because if it was only on that other evidence, speaking in tongues, then that means everybody who don't speak in tongues going to hell. They ain't saved. And that would be a hard argument to sell to God. At least I, do, I believe that. Amen? Okay, so, so now, but we do see that he was active. And look what happened is that Elizabeth started to praise. Now look at this. He says in verse 42, Elizabeth gave a glad cry and exclaimed to Mary, God has blessed you. Now she didn't even know, but now the Spirit is revealing her some, to her some, some things about Mary. God has blessed you above all women, and your child is blessed. To this day, because of these things that were said about Mary in this first chapter, I believe that's why in the Catholic faith, they hold Mary in such high esteem. She was the Virgin Mary, and, you know, they, they have songs that they sing 
in reference to her. So she is held in very, very high esteem because of what is called the Immaculate Conception. Okay? But we can see here that I can see where they could take that from. I can see you can read this scripture here and say, okay, Mary's going to be blessed above all women and your child is blessed. I can see if I'm going to put emphasis on her, then there's nothing wrong with saying Mary is blessed above all women, so we elevate her above all other women. But Jesus said later on when they say, blessed is your mother. Y'all remember that when he was, he was talking, they say, you know, blessed is the womb that had you. Blessed is your mother. And Jesus said, more blessed is those who believe than even my mother. Go ahead, Brother Mike. I don't want to go ahead and just keep talking, but um, we have to separate that because the Roman Catholic Church put Mary before, before Christ. And in the day of, when, uh, of Canaan, he said to them, whatever he said do, do. That's what Mary said. Mm -hmm. He said, whatever Jesus said to do, do it. Now, the Roman Catholic Church, I was a Roman Catholic before. Okay. They said you need to pray. I used to ro roll the rosary. They said you need to pray to Mary, and Mary will give the message to the mother. They said the man is, more, is not compassionate, and the woman is more compassionate than the man. So if you give the message to the mother, the mother will give the message to the son for you. And so we, we channel our message to Mary. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. And then Mary will pray to give Christ the message for, on our behalf. So that's the Roman Catholic doctrine. Bring the message to Mary first, and Mary will take it to the son, not to the sons first. So that's, that's the difference with them in the doctrine. Amen. Amen. And, and I knew they had a strong doctrine when it come to, you know, Mary, but I didn't know it was that strong and, you know, praying the rosary and all the things they do. But I can see if you twist that scripture just a little, you can elevate her to that position. Now, I, I don't think you should elevate her above Christ, but I never forget, you know, that was uh, in, in the Catholic Church, in, uh, there used to be a lot of times the people who were Catholic had this picture of Mary holding Jesus with the little halo around the head and, and the arms. I don't know if you ever seen that picture, and I was talking to a, a person who's Catholic, and, and just like Brother Mike say, more emphasis was on her than it was on the baby that was in her arms. You know, and, and at that time, I didn't have no argument for him. I just, okay, that's what y'all believe. I ain't got no problem with it. I was a young Christian, hadn't read the Bible for myself, but, but now I know. Now, I don't agree with that, but I'm not finna go take on the whole Catholic Church to try to change that, because they, they, they probably ain't gonna listen to Bo, and I can tell you that right now. Amen, amen. Okay, so, but, but you can see this, and he said, now look, this is what she said. Why am I so honored that the mother of my Lord should visit me. This is just talking about Mary coming to visit her. He says, when I heard your greeting, the baby, John, in my womb jumped for joy. You are blessed because you believe that the Lord would do what he said. If you all know the conversation that Mary had with the angel, and at the end she did just the opposite of what Zachariah did. She believed the report. She believed that God was going to bless her to be impregnated without the help of a man. She believed that. And because she believed that, as the angel said, with God, all things are possible. So now, after that, then Mary break out into this praise. And when you think about this praise, uh, Hannah did something similar if y'all know the story, when she got pregnant, found out she was pregnant, you know, she had been barren and, you know, won the child, won the child, and then God told her, going to bless her, and then when she got blessed, she wrote a song. And so Mary here now uh, speak this song, and, and some of my studies say maybe some early churches, and maybe it was the early Catholic church, took these words and put it into a, an actual song that they used to sing. They, they had a Latin name for us. So I wasn't going to bore you with the Latin name because that ain't important. The point that I want to just point out some of the things that she praised them for and how she did it. Because look at this. It says, Mary responded, Oh, 
how my soul praised the Lord. Now let's start right there. You understand me? How do you think your soul, how do your soul praise the Lord? What does that mean to you? If you had to, if you had to say, Finley, if you had to say, oh, my soul praised the Lord. What do you think that looked like for you? Your answer is your answer. I'm not trying to find the, you know, I'll tell you what soul means later, but just your answer. Well, I guess the first thing that came to my mind was it just, just, come, just comes from your own heart. You know, um, you're, not, you're not faking it. You know, you really mean, you really mean it. Okay. Okay, good, good point. Good, good, good answer. Anybody else? Anybody else? I would say everything, everything within, man, just deep within, just everything. Okay. Just so it's internal, something. You know, you can almost sense now that when your soul get involved with your praise, it look like your emotion going to be there too. Everything, and it's uncontrollable. It just, yeah, it yeah, just you look like you're going to have a little bit of, it's, it's hard to get here and not feel something. Brother Mike? Yeah, it's like you're praising and it's, and it's not the flesh. The flesh is out of the way, but the spirit is, which means your soul is, is right within you. And, and, and that's where it comes from. You could, you could see that you could worship. There are people who worship with their lips and worship with their spirit. And so that's why she said, like, she felt it within. So. Amen. And the Greek word there for soul is, is where we get the word psyche, psyche from. And it's the word psyche. And, and it talks about the seat of the person's emotion, you know, deep down on the inside. You know, in the Bible, sometimes the word soul and spirit is used interchangeably. You know, normally when we talk spirit, when we try to separate them, we say spirit is that breathe part of it. You know, when God breathed into Adam and he became a living being, living soul, okay, that breath, spirit. Soul, some say, okay, you're talking about your mind, your will, your intellect, your emotions, things that's deep down on the inside of you. In some places, those two words are used the same way, synonymously. And it's hard, unless you got a, 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 a book that, or, or something where you got that will uh, translate the Bible and look at it and say which word is being used. So sometimes you see that word soul, it could be psyche. Sometimes it could be the word pneuma which normally should be translated spirit, you know, air, breath, kind of where we get the word, you know, a pneumatic tube, that's the same word that spirit comes from, okay? So he says, so, so something deep down. Then in the next verse, how my, she used soul the first time, and now I come back and say, how my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Wow. So kind of going back to what Wayne said, it looked like this wasn't no superficial reaction to what was happening. It wasn't no superficial response. It was something that was taking place. Now, I know this is the debate that goes on in churches all the time. You know, when is someone worshiping God deep in their spirit and when is someone not? Most of the time, you know, we focus on that people outward expression. Even though I do believe that if, if your spirit and your soul is stirred up, there got to be some type of outward response. You know, whether you just patting your feet, your neck get tight, you know, you feel like you want to cry, you got to, there got to be some kind of response. I just, I just don't believe that the Holy Spirit on the inside of you would just have no reaction when, you know, for, for me a long time, I could tell when the Spirit deal with me, because I'm not the guy that's going to jump up and down, run up and down the aisle, but there were certain things that could be said, I could read in the Bible, and man, my neck get tight on the back, it looked like the hair would just stand up on my head back in the day, and, I, and you could sense it, and it just come on you because you done read something or someone done said something. I don't feel like I'm going to run around the church, but I know something is happening that wasn't happening before that was said. And, and ho so when we come to church, all of you, all of you all should have some type of soul or spirit experience. I think, good. sorry, not to cut you out, Pastor. Go ahead, no, no, when you good. Because for a long time, man, for a long time, I have, 
I had the church, the church, when I say the church, the members hold me back in a point where you, you, I feel what you're saying, you, you, you know something is happening within. And some of us might not be used to it, so we kind of hold back, but we could feel something that's moving. But again, I don't know if it's fair that we hold back, we handle that spirit because we don't want to really give it our all, just keep, you know, because we don't know how people might react. We, we ourselves don't even know how we might react. So we kind of hold back. So we give that, I would say, like an outward feeling, like, oh, thank you, Lord. But to really let it out, I think we hold back on that. And I think that's what we have. I, I, I'm just speaking for myself. I know sometimes I hold back because I get scared myself. But if I were really to really let it out, that's what I'm talking about when we are reading the scripture. Giving him everything. I think it, it, yeah, that's totally different. Man. Okay, and, and, and that's a good point. Because when you look at this, now, uh, and all of us have to wrestle with this word, rejoice. And, and, and what does rejoice mean to you? And, 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 and Major, go ahead. came at me. I, I was just listening to what Wayne said. I can remember this like it was yesterday. It was January 14, 2012. Right back there. I was doing just what Wayne said. I was sitting there and just something came over me and I was just trying to like, boy, don't you cry in here. Don't you, don't you, don't do that. Don't do that. It, it was just something. And then by the time I made it to that thing back there, it was I done. Could, yeah, I was done. I was done. I probably would have ran if I could have got that far, but I, could, I couldn't even make it from back there. And, and like Wayne said, it was just something that it just came over. I don't know if it was something that was said or sung or what it was, but I was rejoicing and just telling God how good, he, how good he was in my life. And it was just uncontrollable. I, I, I couldn't control it. Amen. And, and see, and that's a good point. And see, a lot of times... What we think, in order to get to that, we need a stimulus. That's why, in a lot of churches, you have music to go along with that moment, because music is a stimulus. It will make music will get into your spirit. You can't block it out, and once it gets in there, it can get a response out of you. That's that's why at certain times in certain services, just listen when the music starts playing. When you hear the music start playing, you could almost say something is about to happen because we finna get into this emotional thing. But I'm of the mindset, you can read the word and, and the Lord will give you a revelation of what that scripture meant that you've been reading for years and all of a sudden the same tears can come and you don't need a drum beat, you don't need an organ. Now I liked all those things and what you had them because it does add flavor to the worship experience. But when it comes to saying you can't feel God without it, that ain't what the Bible, I don't believe that was an organ playing. When Mary was going through this and talking about this. I, I don't believe that they had the men over there on the little guitars or whatever playing. I believe that was something taking place on the inside of her that touched her feelings, her emotions. And when they get touched, you can do it without music. Hmm. Somebody else got a mic. Wayne, go ahead. I mean, whoever. Yes, ma'am. Sister Mary. I'm going to let her go, go, go ahead first. Go ahead. Oh, good evening. I, I, I'm kind of struggling with, with saying this, but um, um, even when we pray, it's a, you know, you can pray like from your lips and then you can pray from your heart and then the Spirit of God pray for you. I remember a moment when we, um, and I shared it with a few brothers and sisters, we, um, I was a, uh, on a witness team and we were going to the hospital to, to witness to people or uh, uh, make visits and pray. And the, the leader told us don't touch this particular person when we walked in because he could feel a, a demonic force. And so my mom being new in Christ, she went up and put a hand on this person and was praying. And before we got back to the, the van, her hand was swollen three times the size it was. And she was in so much pain I mean, to the point where we thought we were going to have to take her to the emergency room. And this is, this is something happened. I mean, all of us, my sisters, 
the, the it was people from, from the church and all of us was was in this area. But see, we don't talk about this much today, but it happens. But it happened and and not so openly. But we got by the time we got home to to take my mom to her house, her hand was swollen all the way up to her arm. I mean, like it didn't even look like her arm, and she was screaming in pain. And then, and only thing I could think of is Lord, the same way you said that you gave us the power to cast out any spirit that that uh, any foul demon. And and I and it's like a whole nother atmosphere, a whole nother, uh, how can I put it, a realm of me praying. And the Lord allowed little old me as a new Christian to uh, the, the Holy Spirit in me to to pray and command that spirit to go back where it come from. And my, we were going to take my mom to the hospital. And all of a sudden her hand went down. I mean, before our very eyes, but it but it was just so it was a it was another realm of prayer that 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 was there and and but see the church don't want to talk about that now but but it's it it's it's still necessary where it is and and but see I it it, it the children was there and 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 I forgot about this incident to my sister brought it up about two months ago and she was just saying the power of God how he he moved and and really set my mom free because we could have carried it to the emergency room what they were going to do is give us something to, a pain pill or something, but what ha what really had to happen, whatever that spirit was that was attached to her physically, we had to pray that thing and command it to go back to the pits of hell. And I know that kind of sound a little scary to you, but see, that's the kind of, we, we live Amen. in a spiritual world. And, 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 and But see, that should make us want to grab hold to Christ even more, because yes, yes, it's yes, Christ, yes, not. Yes, 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 so y'all, yes. I'm just saying this Amen. in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, you know, I'm not doubting anything you said because you saw it. I don't, I, you know, I, I don't believe you came here striving on this, on this wonderful day in August to tell us a lie. You know, I, I just believe you. So if you said it, have my air. I'm, I'm not doubting that. I know because that goes back to what the, the angel told Mary. But with God, all things. Amen. So now look, so, so, so she says, my spirit rejoice in God my Savior. For he took notice of his lowly servant girl, Mary praise her now, and from now on, all generations will call me my God. Man, she, he's singing that praise right now. We, you know, we... People still talk about Mary and her conception. They call her blessed. Now, we don't elevate her like the Catholic Church do, but, yeah, we still hold her in pretty high esteem. Amen. Amen. So look at it. It says, now, for the mighty one is holy, God, and has done great things for me. He shows mercy from generation to generation to all who fear him. Wow. So she's saying the God that she serves is a merciful God. And that if we reverence and respect him, he will show mercy to us too. Amen. And so we got to believe that because his mercies are new every day, the Bible say, that hey, when we need it, if we reverence and respect him, that we're feared talking about that, then he will show us mercy. And he will show us mercy sometime when we deserve justice. Y'all don't want to hear that, did you? Y'all don't want to catch that. I, I remember when I used to write letters, every now and then somebody get in trouble and they need a, a character reference, especially with the judge, and they say, you know, I remember, it's been years since I had to do one, but I've done several, say, Pastor, will you write me a character reference so I can give to the judge? Well, you know, I know the person probably, you know, did some stuff, but still, the judge got away with his case. And so I used to always end my letter to the judge. Judge, if it's at all possible, show him mercy instead of justice. Now, I don't know if the judge listen to me or not. I'm just a preacher. But I used to always put that in there. Because I believe that sometimes God can move on the hearts of people to where they can show mercy instead of justice. 
We're quick to want to execute justice on folk, but we're not as quick to want to execute mercy. It looked like justice just come easy to us, you know, just come easy. But we got to be like God sometime and try to, try to execute a little mercy sometime. And it can be hard. It can be hard. But what we have to do, we, we must never get to the point where we, where we come across like we, all we are is judgmental Christians. Now, I'm not saying you don't say what's sin, sin. I'm not trying to change God's word. But what I'm trying to say is that even though a person may be doing something that is sinful, it don't mean that we can't have mercy on them. Y'all follow me so far? So she said, now he shows mercy from generation to generation, all who fear him. He said, now look, his mighty arm, talking in the Bible, talking about that, talking about strength there, has done tremendous things. He has scattered the proud and haughty ones, the ones who lift themselves up. He has brought down princes from their throne and exalted the humble. You know, we always say humility is the key to exaltation. The Bible says if you humble yourself in due time, God will exalt you. But the problem is, when it comes to this humility piece, normally that goes against everything that we've been taught. Humility is, is not the way to get to the top of the ladder. If you humble yourself, God will exalt you. God will take you up. God will take you where you need to go. Most people, you know, when you're talking to someone who's not saved, they ain't buying that because they're thinking that, hey, the end justify the means. I want to get to the top of the ladder, and as long as I get to the top, how I get there does not matter. And God is saying to him, it does. You can't lie, steal, and cheat and step on everybody to get to the top and think God going to bless you sitting on the top. Because some of those same people that you did that to, you're going to meet on your way down. But God said, if you humble yourself in due season, I'll exalt you. That's a trust factor there. That's something we got to trust and we got to believe that he can do that because oftentimes we want to rely on our own ingenuity, our own way of thinking because we don't trust that God can do what the words say he can. And, and, and that's where our faith come in. And that's what this is all about. So some think that, you know, she was saying these words with such force and such power. Either she was talking, some people think, of what he's done in the past, or she was speaking prophetically and say, hey, I'm saying this with confidence. He's going to even do it before, after I say this. Before, while I'm talking, God's going to make this happen. It ain't even happened yet. So that's two arguments there, two conversations about what she was saying. But, but what, she, what we need to see here is that what she was doing is describing the character of God. She's letting us know something about God. And we know enough now to know that if we humble ourselves, he will exalt us. If we don't and we lift ourselves up and exalt it, then, you know, he said he's going to bring somebody down. Amen. Now look at it. He says, he has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away with empty hands. And somebody said, boy, I sure will he do that now. Because <laughs> there are some rich folks that need to come down a notch. Amen. That boy who built that car y'all like, he need to come down a notch. And maybe God got to go, you know, come down or not. You know, sometimes you can get so much and you think that you can just rule the world. You need to come down or not. And I ain't call his name, but y'all know who he is. I don't see too many of them out in the driving parking lot, but I, you know, I know the status car, you know, you got one, you know. You need to know somebody, the dude who made the car. What is mindset like? What you supporting? Ooh. But anyway, it's just a car. And you got it, you like it, you love it, drives good, I understand. And uh, but I won't own one. 
Amen. That's just me. Oh, God, I got to stop telling what I would do because I want, because some of y'all may say, I've been going there and buy me one of them cars. That pastor done said that they ain't no good car. I ain't say that. I just say, I won't. Oh, Lord, let me read this again. He has filled the hunger with good things, the hunger with good things, and sent the rich away with empty hands. He has helped his servant Israel and remembered to be merciful. For he made his promise to our ancestor, to our ancestors, to Abraham and his children forever. You got to go back to Genesis chapter 22. It talks about the promise that God made to Abraham after he faithfully was about to sacrifice uh, uh, Isaac. Then after that, God saw his faith and said, you know, he was going to be blessed. All nations of the world will be blessed because of him. And so, therefore, the Jews hold on to that promise to this day. And even when Paul was writing to the churches, he made it clear that we Gentiles uh, have access to that same promise. Because we, have the, we are the engrafted vine. So we have been engrafted into God's promise. And so everything that he promised Abraham now, we say that we have access to it. And so, so, so God made some promises. And then it says now, and Mary stayed with Elizabeth about three months, and then she went back home. Okay, so now, after Mary go home, then we said last week, that John the Baptist was about maybe three months older than Jesus. They was, they was cousin, they was close. But John the Baptist was going to be the forerunner, the one who was going to tell everybody about Jesus. So we're finna get into some of that right here now. It says, now look at the birth of John. It says, when it was time for Elizabeth's baby to be born, she gave birth to a son. When, and when her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had been merciful, that that word is again, merciful to her, everyone rejoiced with her. But why would they be so happy? Why would they be so happy? Why y'all think you'd be so happy? You know, y'all all know you know why, because only God could have did it, and the fact that they was happy because she was so old. I mean, way past childbearing age. And so all these people who have been looking at her saying, this woman ain't going to never have no children. All of a sudden now, she's pregnant and giving, giving birth to a son, and everybody is happy and rejoicing because they say, man, we never thought we could see this day. You know, we never thought we will see this. So because it happened, we're going to rejoice. Now look at this, what it says here. And when the baby was eight days old, they all came for the circumcision ceremony. I think all y'all understood. Even Jesus was circumcised on the eighth day. That was part of the, the old covenant, the law, where babies were taken to the temple on the eighth day, and they were circumcised. And at that same time, normally that's when they gave them their name. He said, now look, they, who is the they? You know, they always doing something, ain't they? <laughs> something like they. You know, they, who is they? You know, they start a lot of stuff. You know, you know they, they said, well, who is they? And you know, some of y'all said, so y'all said, you know, they said it. Well, who is they? Sometimes you need to ask, who is this they? Because they get blamed for a lot of stuff. Amen. So look what he said. They wanted to name him Zachariah after his father. <laughs> but Elizabeth said, no. His name is John. Now Elizabeth, because the angel revealed to her, told the name of John, but that same angel had already told Zachariah that the boy's name was going to be John, which means the Lord is gracious. And, 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 and you know, I, most of us got, got our name from somewhere. So you, I need that. Who named you? Did auntie name you or grandmama name you or daddy name you because he wanted a junior or the second? Or, who named you? Do you know who named you? You know, I, my daddy thought I was going to be Richard Bolden the third. 
But my mama said, no way. Ain't going to be three of y'all running around here. Two is enough. And so she named me Larry. Now, I could imagine she caught a lot of flack. Because I kind of, I ain't had nothing to do with it, but I kind of would have liked to have been Rich the Third. You know what I mean? I kind of, I kind of, what she told me, she said, no, I wasn't going to name you. I know. They want to. Your grandmama wanted to name you that. I said, no, your name going to be Larry. So, so now who named you? Tell me who named you? Well, test them. Um, I'm going to be honest. I don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> but um, I can tell you this. My mom's side of the family, my mom's name is Thalisa Finley. And so, you know, my name's Finley. So she named me her last name. And my, my dad's name's Alfred, and his last name's Woods. So, um, Everybody on my mom's side, last name's Finley, so it's kind of, sometimes it's kind of weird going back because they say, you know, Mr. Finley, and I'm thinking they call talking to me, but they actually talk to my uncle, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and so, um, but yeah, everybody on their side, you know, Joyce Finley, David Finley, Thomas Finley, et cetera. But um, yeah, so I, I'm not too sure why they named me Finley, but I think, I, I get the connection by how yeah. they kind of played, played on with words with it. Yeah, your mom probably trying to, you know, hold on to some of her, Last name, her name, yeah. And you the son. And my daughter did the same thing. You know, I had all girls, and so she figured to honor me, she would name her son Bolden. Now, her husband didn't have no problem with that. I thought he was going to say, no, nah, this is going to be Glenn III. You know, but he went along with it. He named his, gave him his middle name, but she gave him his first name. And so when she had her second son, he allowed her to name it too. So he, she took her mama's name and made it her, her, uh, my grandson's first name, but just called him Jensen instead of Jeanette. So Jensen just means son of Jeanette. So, 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 so some of y'all names come from somewhere. Wayne, did I see your hand? Who want to know who named you, Wayne? Oh, oh, you told me off. Damn, I wasn't going to comment on that. <laughs> okay, go ahead and comment, yeah, Wayne. You told me off a little bit, Pastor. Yeah, but I was reading and, 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 and going back on what you say. Now, look at this lady. This lady was trying to, she, she was barren. She didn't have a kid for all these years. All these years. And now she finally could have a kid and have a kid. Her praise, Pastor, is going to be different than the people that's outside. The mm -hmm. people that's outside is like a surface praise. They're just rejoicing for her. Because this is something that this lady was longing for all these years. And now she finally could have a kid or she have this kid. This praise, this joy is coming from way deep inside. Uh -huh. You see what I'm saying? I hear that's, that's deeper than this little surface thing. You're going to have folks come in here that are going to want that surface praise. And you're going to want some, some, stuff, some folks in here that are going to want that deep Hey, that thing that's coming out from the inside, they want to see change. They want to see, the, it's a total different. Now also, just to pick, go back a little earlier when we talk about the, um, when, the, when the life began. Because the Bible said when he formed man, he just formed him. So it was just a thing then. But when he breathed life into the nostrils and that light, the heartbeat that life began right there. As soon as he breathed, breath into that, that thing became of value. That thing became of worth. You see what I'm saying? That's why in the medical field, even when I got out of the medical field, what we strive to do? We strive to make sure that we could feel a pulse. Oh, oh my gosh. So this spirit thing is deep, man. That's why John, in the baby, as a baby, he could identify with that spirit. Uh -huh. As a baby, so that lets me know as I sit down and I read this, a baby could identify the Holy Spirit within being a kid. He couldn't talk, he couldn't do anything, but the only thing he could do in that stomach was to leak. <laughs> oh my gosh, you get, are you getting this? <laughs> Wait, we oh my gosh! <laughs> I got you, way. <laughs> so it's, it's more to the spirit thing, we need to hold on to this, man. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> Go ahead, Pastor. I'm going to meditate on this, man. Oh, so there's more we could do. Why are we not connected like that? Yeah. Amen. So don't let people say that you, you're crazy about what you said. 
Because I know for sure there's many, some of us that experience something else and we don't want to share because we, oh, they might think that we're crazy. But we handle in that spirit. And that's the way we should be operating, man. If that baby could experience that as a baby, come on. Amen. 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 So, so, so again, I, you know, I still question, where did your name come from? You know, if you're a junior or you're the second, you probably know, hey, I was named after my dad or something like that. But if you wasn't, did they name you after an uncle or a cousin or someone or a famous person? You know. Jonelle, what your name? You got a different name. Jonelle, that could be the combination of two names. Okay, go ahead, Jonelle. My daddy's name is Joseph and my mother's name is Janelle. So my grandmama said Jonelle. Amen. Grandmama said it. <laughs> My name is Kayla. Um, my mom was on bed rest uh, for several months. I have a twin sister. And so she was watching Days of Our Lives. And so I was named after the Kayla from Days of Our Lives. <laughs> I'll meet a couple Kaylas that are around my age. And their moms are apparently doing the same thing, watching the soap opera Days of Our Lives. And they like the name Kayla from one of the characters. So. Amen. Amen. So your name came from somewhere. Amen. You may not know, but it came from somewhere. And when you name your children, you got that name from somewhere. You could have went and got a book and decided, I like that name, where it sounds. Or you could have found a name that you like to mean. Oh, you want to tell me where your name come from? <laughs> <laughs> Anthony, come on. Uh, my name is Chasserine. My dad, his name is Che, and he just wanted all of us to be like CH, so he just made this one up. Okay. So everybody got a CH start into their name. Amen. Can so, so that's what I'm trying to say. Sometimes people do put thought into what they name their children. Amen. Pastor. Yes. I, I want to say my, my name is Mary Denise. Uh, my, my name is Mary come from my aunt who loved the Lord. I mean, she was known to be a Christian. But Denise... My, my mom named me that, but my daddy named me Denise after his girlfriend. So that's how I got my name. But I love my name, Mary I, I, Denise. Amen. Amen. <laughs> now that, that's a story. That's a testimony right there. That, that's a te Okay. Amen. I'm surprised your mama went for that, but, uh, but that, you know, amen. Here you are. Back in them days, 60s, you kind of went along with the Yeah, family. yeah, you're right. Back in them days, ladies was kind of in a position where they had to go along to get along and all that good stuff. Yeah, that dog probably went hunt today. <laughs> <laughs> that, dog went, that dog went hunt today. But, but anyway, anybody else want to share? Jimmy, where, where did Jimmy come from? Get a mic. Major, you got a mic? I will uh, witness here. All my dad's kids have the name starts with a J. Janetta, he named his third daughter after his girlfriend. Wow. Okay. The Lord so, does two girlfriend stories in the same house. Yes, sir. That, that, that's <laughs> the Lord doing something here, y'all. I mean, the whole two story back to, see something. Oh, no, I know. Some in, some in this name. It's all the witness, so it's my dad. There's a story. And so it's no different than that was a story in John's name. The angel has said, you're going to call him in that because the Lord is gracious. So look at this. There's, the, the folk came back in, I think I read this, but what, when she said his name going to be John, the people said, what, they exclaimed, there is no one in all your family by that name. So how dare you come and go name him John? It, Ain't nobody in the family named John. Where you get that name from? He says, so they used gestures to ask the baby's father what he wanted to name him. Because you know, at, at that time, Zachariah still couldn't talk. He's like, hey, Zach, you better speak up, man. This was your wife in to go and name this boy, and you ain't even got to say, you know you want Zach Jr. You know it. They tell you, you better speak up, man. Give us a sign. Write something down. But look what happened. He motioned for a writing tablet, and to everyone's surprise, he wrote, his name is John. Wow. So the Holy Spirit was confirming something that had been said before. Now, he had told him his name was going to be John, 
Then Elizabeth come and say his name is going to be John. Now God, John come back and confirming in writing that his name is going to be John. And look at this. Fred, y'all remember when the, the Lord shut him up and he had said nothing. And they had told him he wasn't going to say nothing to the baby. You know, y'all remember that? Lord, so look here. Instantly, Zechariah could speak again. And he began doing what, Wayne? You see what, you see what I'm talking about, Pastor? <laughs> you see what I'm talking about, church? <laughs> so if they were to come to church today, man, their praise would be way different right now. Because it was deep for them. It was, more, it was spiritual for them. It was a, a whole lot to them. It wouldn't be a surface praise. Oh, go ahead, Pastor. I, I, oh, my God. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> so, Finley, I can imagine John probably jumped up and started shouting a little bit like what he ain't said. He ain't said nothing in months, you know what I mean? His mouth been shut. He's been writing on a tablet. He probably started jumping up and said, praise God, man, for giving me my speech back. Yeah, he said. <laughs> so he began praising God. I mean, and, and you know, the Bible is full of praise. God is deserving of our praise. The problem is, I think we define, we, we, we sometimes minimize, like Wayne said, minimize praise in our service and trying to say, by saying it don't take all that, or we try to redefine what the word praise really means. You know, and in the Bible, when it talks about praise and high praise, that's excitement going on. Something's happening. It ain't, ain't no silent praise. You know, when people praise God, they did it with loud voices, with instruments. I mean, there was a celebration going on. And, but, but I understand now, you know, it, it's more to worship than just to praise. But at some point in time, when God has done something good for us, man, we got to know how to tell him thank you. We got to know how to just exalt him and let others know just how good God is. Brother Mike, go ahead. Yes. Uh, Y'all going to let me finish this tonight because I'm, I'm going to get out of chapter one. Amen. Yes, I'm going I'm, 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 I'm to let you finish. Um, Pastor, what I'm saying, I want to identify a little bit with Wayne. Sometimes we are a little too passive. What, what he's saying there, there is a reason right now for everybody to jump. Had not, he had not spoken until the, child, the angel had shut him down until the child born. And now... Nobody heard him speak as a, as, a preach, as, a, as a priest. And now he have opened his mouth and, and start to speak. So that's the time to shout. So that's why he was saying there would be fire in the house if something like that had happened. When you see a miracle or a change, a uh, divine thing have taken place, then it's the time to shout. Sometimes we miss the time to shout. Amen. Sometimes we do. Pastor. So, Pastor, do, do you think, so, uh, not just on Sunday, but any time, you said the spirit is within us when we accept Christ. So do you think we block it on Sunday when, we, when we're not praising like we should? Do you think the spirit is always here? It's just a matter of us. Coming in agreement, yeah, the spirit is always here. Whether or not we, you know, the Bible talks about quenching the spirit. I mean that, hey, you, he's in us, but we can hold him back. He ain't going to force us to do something that we don't want to do. So we got to be willingly uh, be open to praising God purely because he tell us to praise him. And we got to get out of the mindset, you, you know, just go back here on your own and do a word study of the word praise. And you can just go through the book of Psalms and see wh how all those Psalms and those things that got something to do with praise in it and what they did when they praised God. There's no place that when they started praising God that they just kind of sit down and looked and nobody did nothing. People, people were moving. Same was happening. That was energy. That was, you know, that, yeah, that was movement. That's what praise was all about. I want to say uh, I'm a true Bulldog fan, not, not just by birth. My daughter went there, graduated. I'm a Bulldog fan, so if... if Which Bulldog if you a fan of? Georgia Bulldog. Oh, the Georgia Bulldog. Okay, so I just want to make sure I thought you could call my Crestview. When I see one of our guys <laughs> run a touchdown and we about to win that, that championship, uh, if you had a game... You can hear the, the cheering for miles. So if I can yell to the top of my voice when somebody run a touchdown on the Bulldogs team, when I'm in this house, I, sometimes I want to yell that loud for Jesus, but you know I have to calm it down. But, but one thing I do say, it, it's acceptable to do it there. But if I want to say to the top of my voice, 
and, 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 and praise him for who he is. Oh, no, you got to calm down. It's unseemly. But I beg to differ. I would scream louder. I mean, I may not say it with words, but I can say it from my heart and live it. But if it's acceptable to do that, it should be acceptable, you know. Well, I mean, and, and, and that's an a, a argument I, I've said to people all the time, especially when people say, I'm not emotional. Yeah. You know, I just don't normally express my feelings like that. Well, you just wait till your team win in a close game. Clock running out, they get the touchdown. Somehow you just lose it. Just something come over you. And I just call it that, you know, that spirit of whatever that team is, that Buckeye. Or that bulldog spirit done jumped on you. And you feel like you're right there in the stadium with everybody else. And you sit at your house. And your kids watch. You jump up and down. Say, what in the world, daddy and mama jumping up and down like that? George just scored. They beat Florida. And I'm of the mindset, like you, Wayne, if, if you can do that for a football team, mm. that'll be a little bit of that for Jesus. But he, just a little bit. I mean, just I know a whole lot may be asking much for some, but there ought to be a little bit of praise. Well, you see, Pastor, a little teardrop every now and then I'll just roll down. You know, some of roll just come over you and you just can't contain. The Lord been so good, you just a little tear just roll on down. Just let it go. You just hold, just let it. I don't want nobody to see me crying and say, man, come on, let's let it. You're praising God. We ain't go ahead, man. I know y'all weren't going to live. I didn't even know we were going down I this road tonight. I'm trying to hold tonight. you up, Pastor. Okay, but, okay, what you're saying about the football, that's good. You might be excited. And I'm not nobody who's like that. You may get excited. But say, for instance, nobody know what you've been dealing with and what you've been fasting for. And this thing happened, and you come in here, and it just take up, it just grab a hold of you. And you just release this thing. I'm telling you, people going to look at you like, what in the world? Pastor is not an emotion. And you just let that thing out. I'm it gonna catch on fire. It gonna catch on fire. But that's what I'm talking. It's a it's, it's a difference. You're excited about your team, but it's another thing when you've been hungry for something spiritually inside, and you and nobody knows what you're dealing with, and God came through for you. Or he, oh my, it's different. Amen. And that's what I'm saying. Don't don't handle that thing. Don't handle it. And I think as a church, we've been handling it for a long time. I did it too. I did it too. I'm to the point where I could praise. Yes, I could praise. I could be voiced. I could be loud. But sometimes I hold that thing that really want to bust out because, again, I'm worried about it. what what am I saying. Say. And I don't know how I'm going to look when I finish. Now, look at this, Wayne. You, now, you, the Bible makes your point. Because it said, now, look, let me read this again. Because it's important that you pay attention to what God is saying. It says, instantly after, Zechariah could speak again. And the minute he could, he began to praise God. When he started praising, look what happened to the people. It says, all fell upon the whole neighborhood. When he started praising. Folks had started to say, whoa, what's going on here? And everybody started talking about it. Can you imagine if we had a church service one here Sunday here in Finland and we just towed the house up and everybody was talking about it. Man, when they boy in Finland them left striving Sunday. Yeah. Something happened off up in there and striving on that Sunday and man, everybody was talking about it. When God moves, man, people ought to talk about it. And, and, and we ought to come to church and me included, expecting God yes. to move. So look at it. He says, Zechariah could speak again, and he began praising God. And all fell upon the whole neighborhood, and the news of what had happened spread throughout the Judean hills. I mean, good news should travel. We get so much bad news, and it outrun the good news. It then says, everyone who heard about it reflected on these events and asked, what will this child be, and will this child turn out to be? Boy, that's a serious question right there. What, after seeing all that, they want to know, what will this child turn out to be? For the hand of the Lord was surely upon him in a special way. Amen. So they knew John was going to be special. And, 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 and Zechariah already knew that he was going to be the forerunner. Now these people don't have all the backstory, but they see what's happening. And they say, hey, man, we wonder what's, what this child going to be. 
Man, that's, that's powerful. Now look at this. Then Zechariah come in and start prophesying too. Now look at this. He said, now look, in verse uh, 67, he says, then his father, Zechariah, was filled with what? <laughs> Man, the Holy Spirit just flowing all through this first chapter. Of that. Man, everybody. I mean, he's just flowing. Just flowing. Filled with the Holy Spirit and gave this prophecy. He says, praise the Lord God, the God of Israel, because he has visited and redeemed his people. Brought them back. He has sent us a mighty Savior. Zechariah got the understanding now. From the royal line of his servant, David. Just as he promised through his holy prophets long ago. In other words, this revelation of Jesus coming was, should not have been new. God had promised this. It had been prophesied. But until John the Baptist come, you know, there was no word of prophecy in Israel 400 years. All this was talked about, but they forgot about it or did not talk about it. The Pharisees and all of us weren't talking about it. Not in this way. They were so busy looking for a leader who was going to deliver them from the Romans and be a political leader. They weren't really looking for no spiritual leader like they should have been. He says, now we will be saved from our enemies and from all who hate us. 72. He has been merciful, see that merciful thing again, to our ancestors by remembering his sacred covenant, that one that he made with Abraham. That covenant he swore with an oath to our ancestor Abraham. Again, I told you, you can go back to Genesis chapter 22 and take a look at that if you would like to. He said, now look, verse 74. We have been rescued from our enemies so we can serve God without fear. In holiness and righteousness for as long as we live. So he give us the indication how God want us to serve him. So we should be able to serve God without fearing God, but we, he want us to serve him by trying to live holy and righteous. For how long? Yeah. Man, God is expecting us to try to be holy and righteous as long as we live. Not just sometime and stop and we don't live holy and righteous. He realized we error. He realized we make a mistake. But our goal should always to try to be holy and righteous. But holy messages don't sell. People don't come to church to hear holy no more. They really don't. If, 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 if the word was preached with holy in, in most service today, they would have changed the definition of it to not mean what God meant when he said holy. We will have adjusted holy to the culture that we live in. And we will start calling some things that's unholy holy. God is a holy God. The standard is holiness. And we striving for it. We ain't there yet, but we striving for it. We got to be shooting for holy. Holy is not a bad word in the Christian church. He says, holy and righteousness, in righteousness, for as long as we live. Then he said, look, and you, my little son, will be called the prophet of the Most High, because you will prepare the way for the Lord. That's why John said, I'm one crying in the wilderness, preparing the way for the one to come. Talking about John revealing, being the forerunner to Jesus. He says, you will tell his people how to find salvation through forgiveness of their sin. In other words, everybody know John's message was a message of what, Fred? You say it all the time. John's message was a message of repentance. You say it all the time. John's message, hey, look here, y'all got to repent and turn back to God. Y'all got to repent because the one who's coming that's greater than me, everybody just got to take a turn, turn back to God. That's John was a simple message. Just turn back to God. Because the people had turned away from him, repent just means go back to where you started. Amen. And turn from their sin. He said, now look, because of God's tender, that word mercy keep popping up when it talks about God, man. God know we sinners. Amen. He ain't surprised. Yeah, come on now. I know, not y'all, I mean, I said we, but I mean, maybe not y'all. <laughs> he ain't surprised. Major, he ain't surprised that we still sin every now and then. He know it. 
I told you on Sunday, Jesus said, I know all things about you. I mean, he knows we still sin a little bit. Amen. Don't get quiet on me right there. Y'all all say amen. We still sin a little bit. Every now and then sin just slipping. Ain't none of y'all. God, y'all gonna sit here and try to play me tonight. Ain't none of y'all just, just straight up holy and righteous all the time. A little sin. That's what I'm saying. I'm getting that, Major. I said, what I'm trying to say. We striving to be perfect. Amen. Amen. <laughs> so we ought to be glad that God is merciful. And that he don't always issue justice when we do things that go against his word. He says, because God's tender mercy, uh, of, God, of God's tender mercy, the morning light from heaven is about to break upon us. Talking about the coming Jesus being in Revelation uh, to give light to the world, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadows of death, and to guide us to the path of peace. Jesus is going to come, guide us, and make sure. And, and one thing, he came to make, for us to be able to make peace with God. You know, not only just peace with ourselves, but with peace with God, because before Jesus, we were God's enemy. Amen. There was enmity between us and God, and so Jesus came to bridge that gap to make peace. And because of that, we have peace with God. And now the difference between having peace with God and the peace of God. Of God has to do with your internal peace. When things in your world could be all upside down, but there's something on the inside of you to keep you balanced when the world around you is all upside down. Internal peace, tranquility. But then the external peace said, hey, now I am no longer God's enemy. Because of Jesus, I'm a friend of God. Not at war with him anymore. So he put us on this path of peace. And then the Bible says, John grew up and became strong in the spirit. In other words, he started growing spiritually, uh, whether his, his morals was good, because God, you know, John was strict, man. Yeah. John lived in the wilderness until he began his public ministry to Israel. So John kind of went, I don't know, some people try to say he may have been living out there in a colony with some you know, in isolation and all that, but the Bible does say he lived in the wilderness and one of the charges against him was he used to eat wild oats and, and honey. And, kinda, and, and they called him a madman because he hung around out there in the wilderness. But he was out there in preparation for this assignment that he had. And you know, the sad thing about it is that John's parents was so old that they probably did not live to see him grow up and start executing them because they were probably in their 90s. And man, we read on, this guy right here, man, for the cause, he's going to die a horrible death. This baby that we're talking about now who's going to be the forerunner of Jesus. Yeah. He's going to die a horrible death. All because he caused sin. Sin. Wayne, go ahead. I got a question, Pastor. Now, you just said this baby. Now, could it be that this baby understood as a baby the path his, 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 his calling already as a baby? Help me out with that. Oh, my God. Well, Wayne, wait, wait, wait. He, the Bible leads us to believe he grew up. And became strong in the spirit. So, so, so he was put in a position. You know, it may be the path that he was on when he was born and what had been prophesied about him. He was brought up in a way and, and, and as he grew, he grew stronger in the spirit. Now, how he ended up out in the wilderness and what led him that could have been the spirit. Because the spirit led Jesus, you know, when it was time for him to be tried and tested. So... So when you could help, I can't argue you one way or the other. You know what I mean? I can't argue one way or the other. But the Bible just say that he grew, and we know that when he started his public ministry, he would be the one, and we're going to see that would be the one to baptize Jesus. But man, you know how things change when, when John 
get in trouble and Jesus don't show up. John say, are you the one? Or should I call for, for somebody else? Call for another. Man, I tell you, pressure on. But this is good for right now. We're going to get there. We're going to get there. We're going to get there. I, but again, Luke is a, is, a, is, a, is a book that was written again by someone that was not a Jew, that was highly educated, intelligent, doctor, some believe. So Luke chapters are, are long. You know, Luke said a lot. He witnessed, he, he uh, got evidence from a lot of people. And so his book is a little bit longer than some of the other books. But uh, it's full of good information because he covers some things that you don't see in the other uh, uh, gospel, Matthew and, uh, and, John, and John. Okay? And as well as Mark too. All right. Well, good. Thank you for your comments tonight. Good lesson. And uh, we continue to try to study God's word to, to, to show ourselves approved. Amen?